Evening. We're live. Evening. First Evening. partner chat of the year. So welcome along. If this is your first, welcome along. If this is your 50th, happy new year. Hope you had a great Christmas. Um, first topic of the year that we're addressing is getting ready to buy your first property in 2023. We know a lot of people make decisions over Christmas and New Year. A lot of people come across deposits with family money and that kind of thing. So we thought we would explain the process to a first time buyer. So introducing how to buy a property. Firstly, do you think we should get music back as we as we come in? We did we yeah. did music for a few weeks. I think we should bring back the intro music. Bring right, back stars, the drama. Stars in your eyes. Yeah, something like that. Maybe some smoke. smoke. Right? Have a smoke coming up from below the screen. <laughs> yeah. Tonight, Matthew, we're going to introduce buying your first property in 2020. I'd rate that so highly. Let's do it next week. We'll we'll plan it. We'll bring props. It'll be almost as well decorated as Mike's background there. There's all sorts to look at in the background of that picture. Absolutely unbelievable. But he doesn't have Gary. Sorry, Mike. So, it's more talk over. Gents, thanks for joining me on my, yes, my left, your right. I've got Mike Childs. Mike looks after our High Wycombe and Bucks area. Beneath me, Dan Salisbury of Dan and Neil, who are specialists in Lower Early, Shinfield, Arborfield and Winnash areas. And then down to my left, your right. Andy Mead, head of New Homes Company, Mead New Homes, so selling new homes across the southeast. So Andy's just popped in a very useful guide. If you are looking to buy a new home, which is a guide to buying a new home, which is part of the topic that we're talking about today. Um, so we're going to split this down into seven parts across the half hour or so that we're having a chat seven sort of different stages of buying a property the first stage that we've defined between us in the prep for this chat is your preparation before you even go anywhere near a house let's start with dan what preparation should you be making to make yourself in the best position from a bills and a credit perspective? Okay, so we're, we'll assume you've got to your point where you've got your deposit for your home, um, whether that's 5% or 10%, but then you've got to think about going to get your mortgage. But actually, before you get to that point, it's how you best prepare everything for going to see your mortgage advisor, making sure that you're in a position to do that. So if we're talking about credit and building that up, and that let's say it takes a year to do that, you need to think about how you're spending your money, um, what bills you have, what debts you have and how they're serviced. So that could be credit card debt. Is it clear, which it should be, or if you've had credit card, is it smaller amount to clear it off to build a credit rating, uh, credit rating up, which is a smart thing to do. Um, making sure you've not missed any payments. Um, I can talk firsthand about this because uh, I bought my second home. Not, I don't have two houses, but I sold and bought a new place uh, last year. And as I was doing my mortgage, I actually missed a year ago somehow a water bill, Thames water bill payment of like, it was like eight pounds. I didn't even know. It was like a day or two late. I just paid it off. That actually affected my mortgage to get it and I had to rewrite a letter this is a, it's out, out of the norm so something as small as that to make sure you're not missing any payments is really really important um, and we've also spoken about other things like continuous betting so if you're nothing wrong with the odd bet here or two once a couple of months but if you're continuously betting on the sky bet app for example every weekend and throwing money down the drain it looks like a habit and and, and lenders will look at those things as well yeah, they'll be deducted from your affordability on a mortgage if you're continue if you're putting fifty pound into a Skybet account every every week, then they'll look at that as a as a consistent bill, like a utility bill. So it's something that can be cut down. And if you're going to do it, you can still do it in cash, and no one would ever know, uh, rather than doing it on a traceable thing. Yeah. Um, my tip for that is um, download a free app called Credit Karma. 
Um, it's like I say, it's totally free. Every so often they'll try and sell you a credit card or a loan, but you can just totally ignore that. Um, but it will tell you the best ways to increase your credit rating on a monthly basis. And it will tell you who's credit searching you and it will change you if there's any, tell you if there's any changes in your credit scores. And like you, Dan, I got caught out by, on oh, name and shame, like you did, Barclay Card, um, who I closed a Barclay Card account and a year later they accepted a, a subscription payment from Amazon and uh, charged me for it and then tried to take me to court for a CCJ, even though the account was closed. Um, I eventually chased them through the banking ombudsman and got compensation for it and have my credit record repaired but it could have uh, prevented me from getting a mortgage uh, so I had to act really quickly and I would have never known that if I didn't have the Credit Karma app um, it would have slid right under the um, under the radar because it was all being registered at a previous address so it's a massive thing if your credit rating or you have problems with your credit or you're spending money on different things it can cause a real issue with your affordability on a mortgage so get your credit in order is first and foremost so credits in order credit rating is nice and high you've got a credit card that maybe you're buying your fuel on every month um, and paying that balance off in order to show that you can pay debt um mike next stage actually sourcing the money sourcing the money go and see a mortgage advisor nice and easy um don't go to your high street bank or you can do but i advise just go to speak to a mortgage broker who can give you a full overview of the market and go from there i mean i bought a house my first house was 20 years ago you don't know <laughs> <laughs> that's what i was just thinking before i start logged on to it i've got no memory of doing it in the right order at all, which no advice. I just, I think I bought the wrong house. It needed loads of work. <laughs> I regretted it straight away. I needed this 20 years ago to help me, but I did go see a mortgage broker. Uh, so how do, you, how do you define and how do you find a source the right mortgage broker because in my opinion i've just put one of my friends in contact with my broker and his response he, he messaged me yesterday and said i've gone ahead with the mortgage it was nice to actually get an opinion off someone um for the first time so how would you source and, and find the right broker um how i would do it for recommendation um but from I think you've got to trust them as well personally getting on with them helps family um, and friends who they've used yeah, yeah yeah like if it's a family or friends recommendation that's how i do it on trust i'd ask maybe one or two questions of the broker firstly are you tied to a panel so it's a bit of an estate agency <laughs> jargon here are you panel tied Maybe you can explain that one to, to, to everyone. Tied to open to all the lenders. Um, some mortgage brokers uh, will only have access to a lip. They might may claim they can look over the whole market, but really they're only tied to a few that are, or a dozen that they can access. Um, so you really need to sort of drill down and, and check on that. Access yeah. to all the lenders. <laughs> It's a phrase we've heard many years ago, Robbo, didn't we? <laughs> that was almost the, the line that she used to use, our old IFA, many years Absolutely. ago. Uh, but, it, but, it's, it, but it's true, and it's, it's why you said yeah. it. The, the first thing you said was don't go to your bank. Um, whilst there's nothing wrong with the first stage of just approaching your bank to see what you can afford, your bank are only going to offer you one oh, bank's that. options. Um a, a, a mortgage broker who is tied to a panel is only going to offer you maybe, like you said, 10 or 12. Uh, depending on the mortgage market, there's anything between 400 and 4,000 different mortgage products available. So if you find yourself an independent mortgage broker, they will have a much bigger market, like say access to all the lenders. I can't remember which broker it was, but we used to hear it 25 times a day, Lee. didn't it? <laughs> yeah. Um, but it's it's a massive thing. If you've got a choice of anything between 400 and 4,000 mortgages, you're going to get a much better rate and a much better product from 
I've I've had mortgages with Leeds Building Society, Coventry Building Society, the Bank of Ireland, all sorts of places that frankly you may the post office you may never have heard of. Um because it's not HSBC nationwide or, or Halifax. So important advice I think is to make sure you get that and you get the advice on what type of mortgage to take out and what they all mean, frankly. Um right, Andy, you've got your deposit, you've got your uh, credit in check, you know how much you're able to spend on a property. Now you need to do what? Find a house, but understand why you're moving. And that's going to sound like the most bizarre thing ever. But ask yourself the question: Why are you why are you buying a house? Is it is it um, a second property you want to buy? Is it a bigger property? Is it your first property? You've got to think of a job closer to work, closer to schools, closer to family. Understand that. Understand why you why you're moving. Why you want to move. Yeah, and then go and drive around those areas and drive around the areas you want to have a look at understand yeah. the area that you want to buy in a, a question i ask every buyer and i don't know if you guys do as well is what are your non-negotiables <laughs> what will you not bend on when you're looking to buy a house something that will either make you buy it or stop you from buying it and i had a lovely chat with someone who was not interested in my advice yesterday who'd viewed 60 properties uh and wanted to view a property that i'm selling and he's looking anywhere south west or east within an hour of London for a house. And I said, what are your non-negotiables? And he said, I'll know it when I see it. <laughs> I said, well, is it three bedrooms or four bedrooms or driveway parking or a garage or needs work, doesn't need work or needs to be 10 minutes from a station or needs to be five minutes from an outstanding primary school or do you want to be near a park or do you want to be somewhere you can walk your dog? I know what I'm looking for. And I said, i if you tell me, I can help you. <laughs> I beg to differ. You viewed yeah. 60 houses and you haven't bought one yet. Yeah. Um, You're not going to so... drive every car between a Mini and a Ferrari, are you? So... <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, I've got no problem with people going to view houses because sometimes you get a good feel for what you want and what you don't want. It's a good way of narrowing down and, and realising between things. But if you viewed 60 houses, I would say there's something fundamentally wrong with your search criteria um and you're going to spend and you probably view another 60 before you find something i agree so we've got our credit in check we've got our mortgage agreement in principle written we've narrowed down why it is we're buying a house and what we want it to do uh for us dan let's get out viewing yeah, so um, viewing homes, I think, is really important. Is We've obviously just touched on how many you can view, but I think to start with, once you've got the idea you're looking for a, you want you definitely need to have three bedrooms, you definitely want an ensuite, you want a downstairs toilet, and you need to have a garage, let's say. Those are things you need. You then need to go and see some, because you might be like me and walk into the first place and be impulsive or know what you want so, so clearly, you'll just go and buy it. But a lot of first-time buyers... I would suggest probably view more than one house. Um, and actually, you need to go and, and get comparables and see two, three, four, five to know which one you like, um, to know what you're spending, because you'll see property prices. You'll see different values for very maybe similar homes with the way they're marketed by different agents and the prices run out. So you can work out what the value of a home is to you. Um, the property is only worth what someone's willing to pay. It could be you that's willing to pay that money for it. Um, so ultimately, you can work out what a value of a home is to you and what's important um, and then start to compare and be able to make an offer on a property. Yeah. So out viewing a property, is there, I guess there can't be a definitive list, but is there a list of things that a first time buyer should be looking for or looking at or, you know, worry about or be looking to confirm when they're at house? Um First of all, it depends on what you're looking for. But if you let's just say you're looking for a normal house, it's going to be freehold. We're hoping people know, understand what that means. Um, some of the quick key questions I'd be asking is, first of all, is there an estate charge? Because it's a very common question that's come up in the last probably four years more so, where a lot of new builds or modern builds, there's an estate charge, which 
could be anything from 200 pounds a year to you know maybe even 50 pound a month or something like that and that's also got to be taken into account on your affordability with a mortgage you may it lower what you spend or you might not want to spend that so ask that question so a lot of houses do have it um ask about simple things as well the, the normal questions we get asked every day how old is the boiler <laughs> You know, you want to know those sort of things because you've got to think of the cost you're going to maybe have if you're going to stay there for five years, what cost you may be putting into that home as well. If you're buying something brand new, Andy will be able to advise you probably a bit better than I can, but buying new, obviously, you'd expect everything to be tip top, but there's certain things like snagging and so on later down the line. But I think when buying a buying a, uh, a home, maybe have a list of questions that would be important. And I'm happy actually to put a list of questions together, maybe and pop it on our socials over the next few days so people can print it off and take it on viewings with them there's probably at least five key questions maybe 10 isn't there that could help people yeah, while doing, you know where is the parking is it confirmed is it allocated if it doesn't have a driveway is it two spaces things like that because things get missed and unfortunately people get halfway down a process and then go oh i had one parking space i didn't know or the boiler's 15 years old not 10 and it's not been serviced and i might have to replace it and things yeah. like that so it's things you can know before making an offer definitely i think there's a not a great example for a first time buyer but i've seen a house advertised in my hometown today and i'm not going to name and shame um and on the advert it says uh, plot circa one third of an acre now that's quite a big chunky <laughs> house so unlikely to be a first time buyer's house um but i don't know what your definition of circa one third of an acre is but i looked at the title deed of the property and it measures 0 0.18 which is obviously quite a lot less than a fifth yeah um, that's, not, that's yeah that's not really a third of an acre circa a third is it no not in my opinion it's about half of a third um so from my point of view i think your questions are absolutely right is there an estate charge is the property definitely freehold can you confirm the parking i'd go further can you give me a copy of the title to confirm that detail because estate agents are very far are very very fast to write rounded up numbers which may not be truly measured the owner probably told that estate agent it's around about a third of an acre i think and they went yeah that sounds good that'll help sell it without actually looking at it. It took two minutes to look at it. I thought, it's never a third of an acre on that road. It's 0.18. And on um, that, it's quite simple to get hold of the title deed beforehand as an agent, isn't it? We can get exactly. hold of that and say, there you go. So yeah. it, it's not difficult to get information for people. And that will confirm your parking situation. It will confirm which garage is which, if it's in a block and that kind of thing. Um, Andy, I know you're going to be itching to say, what are the good questions when, when out on a viewing for a new home specifically? Yeah, just first and foremost, no question is a silly question when you're buying a home. 100%. Um, and do not be afraid to ask any question because the laws have changed so much that you cannot lie in terms of if you're asking a, de a definitive question about the boiler, about any works on the house. You can't say, oh, it's had no works done when you've had the whole thing replumbed because you had a major leak you know he's got you've got to be, the owners have got to be transparent um but going on, on on to new builds the warranty who the warranty provider is how long the warranty is um invariably it'd be 10 years but it could be with um nhbc it could be with uh, a shore build it could be with um a lesser um provider that some lenders won't actually touch so you need to understand who the actual provider is. And then before you get your mortgage offer is check with the lender if they go with that um, warranty provider. That's interesting. That's something I didn't know. I didn't yeah. know that some lenders won't touch the providers of warranties for brand new buildings. Yeah, it's, it's only, it's, it's really, I, I didn't yeah. even know that. Yeah, it tends to be the smaller, the smaller lenders. Um, but just ask the question because you don't want to get three, four weeks down the line, get a mortgage offer, and then the mortgage offer says, yeah, fine, but we're not actually we're not going to give you a mortgage offer because you're with that provider. So it's, it's understanding who the who the warranty provider is and what 
warranties the developer is giving you on top of the NHBC or the other warranty providers. Now, the majority of developers will give you a, either a one-year or a two-year warranty on certain things. You can then get the 10-year warranty on your appliances if you register those. And it's all understanding what developer is doing what. And that's and that's only goes by asking the question to whoever's showing you the property, whether it's the sales advisor, whether it's me as the guy who owns me new homes. I will know all that before I show anybody around the house. I'll know the warranty provider. I'll know what um, provisions you've got. I'll know what additional cover you can get just by registering your appliances. Because a lot of people don't understand if you register your appliances, you actually could get a ten year warranty on them. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's understanding that. I think the stickers for that are still on the front of my washing machine. <laughs> Fancy sticker, never pulled it off. Probably yeah. should do with that. Um, but it's, it's, it's a very good point. Is there anywhere you can go to get that kind of advice? Anyone you can follow, uh, apart from yourself on social media, obviously? Uh, not really, no, because each, each developer has got different warranty providers. Um, I say the majority are NHBC, Build Assure. There's 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 numerous de- um, developers, but the mortgage advisor will be able to give you a list of, say for example, you're going with I'll say Leeds Building Society because they're the best football team in the world. Um, it's uh, if you leave with Leeds Building Society, Leeds Building Society will have a list of who their um, warranty providers they'll use are. If you're not on that list, they won't give you a mortgage on it. So they'll be clear, but there's a lot of different banks and building societies out there, so it takes some research. Yeah, 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 definitely, yeah. Okay, so fingers crossed we found something that we actually like and we want to buy. Um, maybe we can go around the room here with a couple of tips each. Making an offer and securing the property. <clears throat> Michael, what are your top one or two tips to when you're putting your offer forward, how to put your offer forward in the best possible way to, I don't know what the rest, what the best phrase is, impress the, the seller and the estate agent. Uh, speaking from experience again, 20 years ago, I would ask for advice. If I'm a first time buyer, buying my first property, making my first offer, I'd ask for from advice from people who've done it before, from other from friends or family who've bought a property because i can remember i made one offer the estate agent said no you need to pay the asking price and i said okay just done no research into the area what other house prices have sold for just jump straight in so i'd get a bit of advice first of all uh, before making an offer of any level so- You've bought and sold houses. You do it all day, every day. What is your one piece of golden advice for that person? Is it research? Yeah, do your own research, first of all. Know the market. Because I think if if people call me and they make an offer on one of my properties and you you can tell straight away if they've done their research into the area, you know, they know, you know, straight away. And I think I, I pass that information on to my sellers, you know education they know what they're talking about so do your research and nowadays with right move zoopla albeit you don't want to look at the zoopla the price of the property because that's all over the place but you can get a, a rough idea or a very good idea of what a property is worth just from spending 10 15 minutes online yourself absolutely what about yourself dan it's a couple of things really um First of all, in terms of the level of offer, it's, all, it's obviously you can get advice and so on, but it is um, completely up to the person making the offers. And then, uh, the only thing I'd say is to think about how long you're going to be there. If you're buying your first time, you think you're going to be there for five years. Um, I might have paid five thousand pound more for the place I'm in now, for example, but I'm going to be here for a while, so actually it's going to pay itself off. I'm not really going to worry about it if it secures me the home and others are interested. And even though we're in a market now that might be a little bit slower. If properties are priced correctly, there's still going to be two, three, four buyers for the houses because there's a lot of people out there wanting to buy. So just think about what you want to pay, but make sure you don't walk. The way I would say it is if you're going to walk past that house in three months' time and someone else is living there and you went, crap, I would have paid an extra grand, you probably should have if it's just an extra thousand. And it could have been the difference between securing it or not. I don't know. 
So just pay what you feel comfortable with and you can walk away from uh, with, your, with, your, with your head held high. Um, in terms of presenting an offer for a first time buyer or any buyer, I think, I think it's really important to sort of not oversell yourself as something fake, but just give an honest account of why you want to live there what your position is and putting it in writing. So you can make the offer over the phone, but always follow up with an email, make sure you've got a record of it and say, it's myself or me and my partner or whatever. I wanna, the reason I love this house is because the location, it's got everything I've needed. I've viewed five houses, it's the perfect one for me. The best offer I can make is X. I'm not looking to negotiate, but it's my, my, my best offer I wanna put forward. And uh, these are my finances. This is my mortgage advisor. These are my potential solicitors I've got ready to line up. I have a month's notice period. I'm living with parents and I can move at this speed or at this pace or I can be flexible. Whatever it may be, give them every bit of information because your offer will stand head and shoulders to get above the next person who just makes an offer going, I offer 400 and that's it. You stand ahead of them because you've been informed to that front, done your research and you're ready to rock and roll. That's what I look for when I'm putting an offer forward to a seller. I think it's key. And all the parts we've mentioned, apart from solicitors, which I'm sure we'll come on to, you'll have that all in place. You look like an absolute A-star buyer. And I think that's what you want to be as a first-time buyer, as an A-star buyer. Andy, from the new homes perspective, making an offer, how do you make the best offer that uh, that the developer's going to go for? I think first and foremost, as a buyer, you need to understand timescales when the property is going to be ready. And I think that goes back to secondhand stuff as well, is that he's understanding what the seller's motivation is for moving and what their onward, what their onward plans are. Because if you're a first-time buyer and you can wait three, four, five months, then Mrs. Jones, who's desperate to move and is selling her place because she needs to be near her uh, elderly parents who are not very well, time is of the essence for them. Whereas if it's not that, and they're, we're moving for other reasons, it's it's understanding the, the timescales. Um, but with a new build, I would um, try and understand the build program. The property's not built. Um, I would do an awful lot of research on the developer in terms of their deliver, deliverance and deliverability. Because um, it's all one well and good saying, no, it's going to be summer. But is summer June, July, August, September, October? You know, nobody knows. Um, so find a developer that will give you an idea. And I know it's, it's, it's the problem with new builds, and this is always very difficult, is is saying exactly when it's going to be ready if you're buying off plan or if you build, if the property's still under construction because you've got an awful lot of third, fourth, fifth party involvement that could cause a delay. Um, but it's understanding what the how, how, how quickly the developer is. And, you know, I've got the development at the moment where, we were saying December, and I was saying with the developer, I said, oh, that's, that's far, and we were selling them back in April, May of last year, and he was saying, no, it's December, it's December. And lo and behold, it was December, because there was an issue with some materials coming, there was an issue with something else. So it's, rather than I was saying to the, saying to the buyer, it was August, September, it was in December, it was December, and that's when the days were. So it's, it's 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 being honest and understanding what the development the development's criteria is. If they're saying it's a summer, if they're saying it's autumn, if they're saying it's winter, well, winter in the UK could be anything from November to April. Easter. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So okay. it's, it's it's understanding what what how they how they define a season. Yeah, totally agree. I'm. Dan, I'm absolutely on board with your um, proposal of putting something in writing that is not just a number because we've all had offers from people, which is a text message, which reads 386000. Yeah, what, 386000 monkeys? Um, (laughs) And and, and that's all you get from someone and, and you're expected to 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 tell someone why they want to sell their house to that person. I would absolutely 100% be writing a letter to the addressed to the seller, to the agent saying, my name's Mike. I want to buy your house because I'm desperate to get my son into the local school before next year. 
the reason I want to buy your house is I've driven past that road for the last 15 years and I've always wanted to live there, whatever reason it is. So there's some sort of emotional attachment. And as you say, attaching the details of your mortgage broker who can verify your finances, proof of my deposit, proof of my solicitors, everything to show that from for, for the estate agent, I'm going to be really easy to deal with because I'm a professional. And for the seller, I'm providing absolute certainty that I'm going ahead. I'm not just buying it because I'm panic buying or because the housing market's going up or down or left or right. I'm buying it because I actually want the house. That's really, really important to me. Is And that's something I convey to my sellers is I'm really confident that these people are going to go ahead because they're desperate to buy your house because they love your house for whatever reason. Yeah. And there's something that if you worked for the organization that, myself dan and andy did some years ago and michael managed to avoid um a great bit of training where it was always drummed into us there's four reasons for either buy for, for selling a house speed price ease or certainty that might take you back um spec okay. as it was called <laughs> um, yeah. but if if as a buyer you can ask that question of the seller why is it there? What is it that they're looking for in a buyer? Are they looking for speed? Like, like Andy said, they desperately need to move because they've got ill parents 200 miles away. Are they looking for price? Maybe they're downsizing, so they need to get the maximum value. Are they looking for ease because something's happened in their life and they just need to dispose of the property? Or are they looking for absolute certainty that it's going to go ahead? Maybe they've reserved a new home and put up a £10,000 deposit for that new home. And they have to have that house sold by the 1st of April. Otherwise, they're going to be in all sorts of trouble and lose £10,000 out of a deposit. If you as a buyer know whether it's speed, price, ease or certainty, you can tailor your offer to suit that seller, in my opinion. And whilst it's a bit cheesy, spec. It's uh, it's one worth remembering. Very much corporate, uh, corporate do, do training. You know, I was going to say, you know, the other thing as well with uh, selling a house from the seller's point of view, no matter what we say, and some of it is business related, it's just a transaction. But I'd say 90% of the time, there's definitely emotion in it. People want to see their home they've lived in go to somebody who's nice or going to be a nice neighbor yeah. they've made friends with and things like that. It does play into it. Like, if you know they're nice people, like or at least you think they're nice people because that's what you describe yourself as it um it definitely definitely does help with the decision making process definitely so right we have got our bills in order we've got an aip we've narrowed down why we're buying a house we've viewed the house we've secured the house by making a phenomenal offer on the property um the process this is the dark and dingy bit that nobody understands if there's a conveyancer watching live, say hi. Um, if you dare. <laughs> <laughs> or a surveyor or anyone in the professional <laughs> services, drop us a little hello. Um, I say no one understands it. It is an understandable process, but it is a confusing process if you only ever move a few times in your life. You, you, it just blows your mind. Um, guys, what are the milestones of, of, of the purchase of the property once an offer is accepted? I think, first of all, you need to find yourself a good conveyancer to do it all. Um, How do you do that? Well, don't get get quotes from various different companies. Don't go with a cheap one, the one that's just online. Again, get recommendations. Has anybody actually used that company before? Uh, if you are getting quotes from that solicitor, are they coming back to you quickly? You know, That's often a sign. If they take a week to come back to you with a quote, how quickly are they going to respond to you when you're trying to buy a house? Um, <clears throat> God, I've got loads of things there. Um, I think if, if you're buying, sorry, sorry, Mark, but if, cool. if you're buying a new home, any new homes company will have a panel of two or three solicitors they would recommend to you that all three of them have already got the contractual paperwork, they've already gone through the contracts, um, and they are there ready and waiting. Now, just because the developer has put them forward as a preferred company, they are still working for you as the buyer. You are still their client. The developer is not their client. Um, 
the developer is recommending them because they know they can get the job done in a timely manner. Now that would save you, the buyer, time, stress, and money. So if you're buying a new home and, a, and the developer is recommending you three, three solicitors, use one of those three solicitors, whichever one you feel happy with. Okay, but if you're buying a home and the estate agent recommends a solicitor to you, I would question the estate agent, why are you recommending me this solicitor? Because more often than not, they're a load of... <laughs> Do, you know, I... Insert, yeah. Do you know, I, no, I get that. That is true, because this uh, we've all been there before, right? Um, the last place it works, so we were... I was paid an extra few quid. Not not great deal, but every time I got them to use a certain solicitor and they weren't very good, that's how we were told to do things. But one question I try to do with as a where we do things now is I get people to tell me which list they want to use and I just say I'll just tell you if they're good or bad that's it I'll give you an honest opinion you can make your own decision because I've seen enough to know which ones aren't that great and if someone goes I'm going to use x and x and I know they're terrible I'm just like look pick whoever you want but just please don't go with those specifically sort of thing so but yeah you've got to do your own research haven't you Michael you just got to look into it best you can yeah well I think yeah being comfortable with your solicitor is a great place to start before you go anywhere but I'd usually say if I, if you can, from my experience selling and buying with them as well, is someone local maybe you can get to in town. You can physically go and then drop paperwork off if you need to rather than having to post it and rely on the postal system. It's not exactly great, is it? Um, a raw mail is pretty crap. Um, and being going to go in there, That's speak a whole to different half hour, that is. <laughs> yeah. But do you know what I mean? Maybe someone local, reputable, has been in town, been around for a long time. You'll always find two or three solicitors in your local high street in town, wherever you live near. There's always reputable ones in there. So I'm sure you can find one if you pop in. Yeah, I think local can be important. I obviously work in Bracknell and employing a Bracknell solicitor to do a transaction in Bracknell can be very important because there's certain weird anomalies that happen that if they've dealt with 20 other houses in that development, they're going to know before it even comes up and deal with it rather than throw all the paperwork up in the air and start investigating something that doesn't need investigating. Um, I've seen, if anyone is watching that knows Bracknell, I've seen uh, properties being described as a flood risk because they're near the cut in Warfield, which is actually 14 feet below ground level. Um there's, prop there's properties in Janet's Park where the streets aren't adopted, so solicitors don't know what to do. Um, there's properties that are formerly leasehold properties that are now freehold properties in Wooden Hill. If you employ a local solicitor, they'll know how to convert that into a freehold property on the title um, in minutes rather than tell you it's a leasehold property. Um, so all sorts of all sorts of things where a local solicitor will just already know it. Mike's just raised an eyebrow. He knows what I'm talking about and what, what roads I'm talking about, I think. Um, and probably been through that pain with the solicitors over the years. It's an important thing. And, and as you say, my my tip on it is, is to make sure you're going to have access to what they call, in their jargon, the fee earner. Not just... Yeah a conveyancing assistant, I want access to the fee earner because they're the person who sign things off. They're the people who make the decisions. They're the people who give the advice. And I want direct access to that person. I don't want it to be coming through an assistant. Um, I think that's important from my point of view to have direct contact. And that sometimes defines whether you're getting hold of a good solicitor's firm or what we in the industry would define as a factory conveyancing outfit, um, which we'll tell you about in private um, at a different date. So the happy day comes maybe 28 days down the line if you're buying a brand new home and all the paperwork's already been done. It might come six months down the line if there's a chain of properties. Um, but the completion day now what happens let, let's roll back slightly maybe to exchange and completion what happens what should you be doing what shouldn't you be doing guys i'll start if you want. <laughs> go for it Miss the completion well, I guess first, <laughs> first of all just to maybe break down the jargon so people know if you're a first time buyer you exchange contracts before you complete exchange is usually seven days or seven working days prior to completion can be longer has known to be on the same day but you try to avoid that if possible 
And what it basically means is exchanges when typically 10% of the purchase price is put forward on the next home to secure it. So the contracts are then binding. And then on completion is where the rest of your money and your mortgage funds are drawn down to purchase that home. And on day of completion, you've got to wait for the money to work its way up. So let's say it's 250,000 you've borrowed and got going up. That needs to be released in the morning and get to the next house for it to officially complete. And when we've been notified it's completed, the estate agent is legally allowed to give you the key to your house. <laughs> so that to break that down, I thought I'd just explain that bit. Absolutely. Again, it's jargon, isn't it? You know, what is exchanging on a house? What on earth does that mean? Is that a good thing? Is it a bad thing? Do, you know, what, what do I do? Is, is it, those are the sorts of things that people need to know. Andy, how does that differ in the new homes world? Uh, if you're buying off plan or the property's not ready now, until the property's signed off, so it's got the legal sign off by the NHBC and the um, local authorities, you can exchange contracts, but you can't complete. And obviously, you can't exchange contracts with a fixed date unless you've got all the information. So what you tend to do on a new build is you exchange on something called notice. Now, the notice period is a two-week notice period that the developer has to give you to complete. So therefore, you will exchange contracts in at the end of January and it will be on notice. With But you will have a, a rough idea on the days that, and the date that you're going to be looking at. So it could be... March, first week of March, second week of March, third week of March. So if it's going to be the middle of March, you will, the developer through the legal system will contact you on the 1st of March and say, we've now got everything in place. We're ready to complete. We would like to complete on the 14th of March. Or if you want to do it earlier, by mutual agreement, you can both do it earlier. So you could do it on the 2nd of March, but both parties have got to agree. But it's got to be. It's there's. It can't. It's got to be a fourteen day period. So you can get everything in place for that fourteen days. And you need to make sure. You need to make sure that your mortgage offer, when you exchange contracts, will still be in place, for the anticipated completion date. Because if your mortgage offer is expired, you can't complete, and therefore you're in breach of contract. But that's all things that are, if you look at the, the, the um, document, of the um, link I put in the document, Guide to Buying a New Home, it's all on there. Or if you're unsure about anything on a new build, whether I'm selling it or whether I'm not selling it, just drop me a line. Because there's a little bit of, um, it's, it's different to buying a, a brand new, a second-hand property. Yes. That's generally point. speaking, just, just, just for like clarity on that, a mortgage offer generally lasts about six months. And yeah. obviously, sometimes you will reserve a house 12 months in advance of it being ready to be built. So your mortgage may expire and you need to reapply or have that have an extension or have a specific type of mortgage in place that will cover you for that period of time. So it's kind of what we're getting at there. Mike, tips for completion day? Uh, drive all the way to the town centre to the estate agent office. Hang on <laughs> Wait for them to turn up to give you the keys. Yeah, parking ticket. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> in a, in a long is, wheelbase van. Yeah, uh, going back to what Dan said, once you're if you're the first time buyer and you get the call saying your completion's gone through, um, you get all excited, you want the keys immediately and you want to get in straight away. But don't be too angry. I can remember being very angry when somebody hadn't moved out by two o'clock a long time ago. Um when I was buying the house, not now. Um, but that whole chain has all got to come together. That whole chain has to complete. Other people in the house, it's a big move for them, packing up and moving out themselves. Just don't be too disappointed if you're not in that house by, I don't know, 11 a.m., 12 p.m., but just because your completion has gone through. Again, yeah, it's, it's getting a good understanding of what the chain situation is. If you're buying an empty house, you can expect to have the keys by 11 o'clock reasonably can't you but if you're buying a house where the sellers live there and they're moving on and those people are moving on those people are moving on those chains can complete in mid-afternoon and yeah. people cannot physically leave that house until the until the completion's gone through so it well, is... a, lot, yeah, a lot of it goes back to the solicitor as well if, they, if you've got a solicitor that's worth their salt they'll apply for the funds 24 hours before the completion date so they've got the yeah. funds in their account at 8.30 in the morning. 
So they, they can then start blossoming. It's the ones that then apply for the completion funds on the day of completion. <laughs> that's where the ones that didn't get delayed. Sometimes it could happen. Yeah. So got another, got another little sneaky tip, by the way, as well. People didn't realise this, but correct me if I'm wrong. But I'm pretty sure to exchange contracts on a house, you need buildings insurance because you because you technically yep. own it, don't you? Or come out to so you have to have your buildings insurance in place for an exchange. So um, in between this crazy process, have a little uh, compare the meerkat and see see what buildings insurance you can get for your property. <laughs> Um, in place, you have to ask questions like what what uh, window locks do you have and door locks. You have to know that sort of stuff in the age of the property. But you need that signed up for when you exchange. Yeah, absolutely right. You you do hundred percent need to ensure the building between exchange and completion, just in case. And I have heard some nightmare stories of incidents recently happening between exchange and completion actually on new built houses where they've been broken into. Oh, really? um, so the insurance has been absolutely vital um, at, at that point on, on, on a development. So really, really important tip there. And a lot of mortgage companies will point it out and enforce it. Maybe some won't. So it's very, very important that you insure the property from exchange to completion, definitely. So a lot of it now will be on the mortgage offer. It'll be a condition of the mortgage offer. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think you're right. Yeah, that's why they won't, they won't allow you to exchange, will they, without it? Hmm. Uh, I don't think so, no, but they definitely won't allow you to complete unless you've got the document to show you've got insurance. Mm -hmm. Should be something in mortgage broker should be asking you to do, definitely. Yeah. Um, okay, so we've been on for 45 minutes. Hopefully, we've picked up a few points or given people a few tips on the system making sure it works in your favor as a first time buyer um ensuring that you can secure a property over somebody else and tips for sourcing the right financial advisor mortgage broker and um and for conveyancing as well someone's just sent in a really last minute question andy mead two questions actually yeah uh oh there we are, Andy Mead, for two minutes. Your top does help to buy, does help to buy delay the process. Well, if you haven't applied for it, you can't have it now. Um, and um, does it delay the process? Not really, no. Not if, you, if you're using a solicitor that knows help to buy and you've got a mortgage broker that knows the help to buy process, the mortgage broker should, if they're worth their salt, be helping you along with the process. So long answer, long answer short, no, it shouldn't, but yes, it does. If you don't use the right broker. If you're left to do it yourself, then you'll get it wrong. You've got some Absolute mindful, mind yeah. Yeah. If, you, yeah. if you've got somebody who knows what they're doing and they know how to do it, they will do it for you properly. The problem with help to buy is if you get it wrong, they send it back to you and then you go to the back of the back of the queue. So um, it's having a solicitor that understands the help to buy process. And it's having a mortgage broker that understands the help to buy process. Yeah, but I think my impression of the help now, to buy you... process is someone has a massive in tray and they work from the top to the bottom. And anytime anything's wrong, it just goes straight to the bottom again. Um, yeah, I mean, Jess, if you want to contact me directly and if you're having problems with help to buy, um, if you've already applied for it, if you applied for it before the end of October, you'll be you'll be fine. If you you wouldn't have been able to apply for it after the end of October. But if you are having problems, just drop me a line on the on my link and then I can have a chat with you about it because it's um it's it's a bit of a minefield if you don't know what you're doing. Gents, thanks as ever for your time. We'll be back next week addressing another subject in detail. So if you've enjoyed it, put a note in your calendar, subscribe to our YouTube. Follow, the ch follow any of our social pages that are tagged to this post and we look forward to seeing you next week. Indeed. See you later. See you.